Hello and welcome to the online version of AUT 159. Um, I once had a student recommend that all of the lectures should just get recorded to YouTube so that we can just do shop activities while we're at the school. Um, and I thought that was laughable at the time, but um, I guess all, all things come in time too, huh? Um, so here we are, YouTube lectures. Hopefully not something that we'll be getting too used to in the future, but at least for the times that we're living in right now, this is what we're what we're gonna have to deal with. So you see my little floating head over on the side and the slides up on the screen. Um, this is how most of the lectures are gonna go. I think it's important that we still get to see each other a little bit, not that I get to see you so much, but um, I don't know, some human interaction seems like it goes a long way these days. So I miss you all and um, let's just dive right in. So in this circuit, we're really going to be um, bridging the gap between electrical circuits and electronic circuits. So electrical circuits are what we've been dealing with um, recently. They're the circuits that do the work. Um, usually high current flow and low resistance, because I can't flow very much current if I have lots of resistance, right? It restricts my current flow. Um, and these circuits are like our starter motor circuit, our power windows, um, door locks, Think about movement, um, anything, we're using electricity to create movement, and that's what they're talking about here with this electromechanical devices. Um, electro, electricity, mechanical, well, that's pretty straightforward, so using the electricity flowing through our circuits to make work happen. Um, on the electronic side, this tends to be more like processing and sensing, so we're going to use really, really low current flows and most of what we're really paying attention to is voltage. So if you think about um, computers, oftentimes zeros and ones, binary code comes to mind. And that's what they're talking about here with on and off signals, right? Zero is off, one is on. Sometimes you'll also hear that referred to as high, low. High is on, low is off, you know, high voltage, low voltage. Um, these circuits are what we're going to be playing with on our breadboards and that kit that I sent out. Um, so we'll start to get pretty familiar with the pieces that make these things possible. Um, and see that you can't completely walk away from the electrical circuits because the whole point of having um, electricity on our cars is to make some stuff happen for us. But the electronic side of the situation is definitely growing more buttons inside of a car every single year it seems like and more features that come along with that as well so i'd like to start with a little bit of review i know some of this stuff will um, be really similar to what we dealt with in the fall but i think it's important to start from a good foundation so we'll go through this um, fairly quickly there are some points that i want to make sure we talk about and remember um, and then we'll start moving into some new concepts later on so we all know the Atom is is um, what we're dealing with when we're when we're working with electricity. We're trying to strip these electrons away from atoms and get them to hop from one at one atom to the next to the next, and flow through our wiring so that the work we want done gets done. Um, our protons are positively charged. Our electrons are negatively charged, and that's where we get like the positive and and negative for our battery terminals. Um, this one is a balanced atom. Um, we have the same number of electrons as protons, six protons in the middle, six electrons orbiting that nucleus. There are also neutrons as well. Those don't have a charge. They're um, just pretty heavy um, parts of our atom and make up some of the mass that makes it so that the electrons want to orbit that, that nucleus. Um, unlike charges attract, so that's why when we have a positive and a negative terminal of a battery, that's what compels the current to flow. And like charges will repel. Um, and that's kind of the idea if we have voltage on both sides of a circuit, no current will flow depending on, well, those voltages have to be equal for no current to flow, but still, it's the same idea. If we can un get an um, atom to become unbalanced, then we can actually start making it more easy to strip extra electrons away from that atom and get them to flow through the circuit. And what our battery is there for is to 
create an imbalance. And that imbalance is measured in volts. That's our voltage. It's the potential. It's the force. It's the pressure. There are many ways to think about voltage, um, but all of them come down to one thing. They compel our electrons to flow. And um, nature wants balance. And so that's what's, what is really trying to happen is inside of our battery, we have a built up charge on that positive side. And because there's all this extra charge on the positive side um, and there's a lack of charge on the negative side, then our current tries to flow to create that balance between the, the two plates and make our, our metal inside the battery even again, right? Two, two similar types of metal would be a discharged battery. Um, different atoms have different compositions. What we tend to deal with is copper for our wiring, but aluminum is in wiring as well, and sometimes even tin. Um, and there are some contacts that have some gold in them as well. So any kind of a metal is going to be a conductor and it's going to um, allow current to flow through it. You can see with this copper atom here that we have multiple rings and each of these rings um, can only hold a certain number of electrons. They're called shells. Um, and on our copper atom, the valence ring, which is our furthest ring from the center of the atom, only holds one electron, which makes copper a very, very good conductor because I can put all my force to that one electron and strip it away pretty easily. You can also see silver is the same way, so silver is also a very good um, conductor. Aluminum is a good conductor as well, but not quite as good. You see how we have three electrons in that valence ring, so that means that the force gets split between all three. So aluminum has a little bit higher resistance than copper or silver. And so that's why we see copper so often. Silver is expensive, so we're not going to be wiring up cars with silver stranding. I don't know, maybe you get into some luxury vehicles where they think that's cool, but not, not with any of the stuff that we're going to be playing with. Um, and that's just going on talking about that free electron in the valence ring. So like I said, this is copper again. That one electron in the valence ring makes it um, pretty easy to strip it away and get it to hop over to the next atom and then the next and the next and the next and that's our actual current flow. And off it goes. Go do some work for me, little electron. Um, conductor. Um, a conductor is going to be any element that has um, three or less ele electrons in that outer ring. And that's because, right, as we build up more and more electrons, it becomes harder and harder to free any of them. So this conductor here with just the one is a good conductor. Insulators are going to have five to eight electrons in that valence ring. Eight's the maximum number that can be in that ring. Um, so that's why that's there, and that's just all physical science. But um, with these... Um, extra electrons here on this one I have six that means that the force would be evenly split between all six of the electrons making it pretty hard to flow any current um, that doesn't mean that it's impossible we can burn through insulators um, and like we have spark plugs that jump through the air right so um, jump spark through the air anyway and so no insulator is perfect but likewise no conductor is either Semiconductors are really the, the how do I want to put it, the semiconductors are, are really what make electronic circuits possible. These are devices that they change their resistance or maybe they produce voltage um, based off of the environment that they find themselves in. Some will create light, some will create heat, all kinds of really interesting things. Um, and they call them semiconductors because they tend to have attributes of both a conductor and an insulator. This has four electrons in that outermost ring. Um, and because of that, they're really straddling the line between those two. And it makes for some pretty interesting things um, that are possible when we build circuits with semiconductors. And we will, so you'll get to see some of the neat outcomes that, that come along with semiconductors. And then there's our current. 
flowing through the wire and, the, and these electrons physically have to make the journey um, all the way through the wire. In an AC circuit that's not quite as much true we're just compelling electrons to move back and forth but with direct current which is what we're dealing with those little electrons have to go on quite a ride. In the automotive world and many trades for that matter um, we use the conventional um, theory for current flow which says that current flows from positive to negative. We have a built up charge and that charge wants to flow to negative to create balance and discharge the battery. One amp of current flow is a whole lot of electrons flowing. 6.28 billion billion electrons past a point per second. So one amp of current flow is actually a substantial amount of, of uh, work that's being done. Um, and so when that kind of brings things into perspective when we think about electronic circuits and really low current flows, I mean, there's still a lot of electrons that are flowing through these circuits even when we have super, super high resistances. When we measure amperage, we're going to use an ammeter. Um, and that ammeter needs to be in line or in series with the circuit. So I just like to think of an ammeter as one of my conductors. Current's going to flow through that ammeter. And so you can see in this circuit we'd have current flowing out of the positive side of the battery through the light. The light will light up through the ammeter. And this is where the measurement's actually taken. And it's, count, it's like sitting there counting one, two, three, four, all the electrons that are going through. And then back to ground. You could put this ammeter on the positive side and it would work just the same. Put it right here and instead of having this wire, and then we'd have that wire over on the ground side. And the circuit will be working when the ammeter is making its measurement. We all remember from the 150 class that we have to be careful about what circuits we use our ammeter on. We need to know how much current should be flowing through the circuit because we have a maximum um, current capacity of 10 amps in our meter. If we go above that, um, we pop a fuse and then we're done testing amperage until we can get a new fuse inside the meter. Um, on some circuits it can actually even be pretty dangerous because if you took your ammeter and hooked it up to like a outlet in the wall, um, those are 30 amp outlets and so some of those circuits are capable of pushing 30 amps through them um, and that would be a very painful experience and that's why they put the fuses in the meter so if we accidentally probe a circuit that is doing something we weren't expecting like maybe there's some sort of a fault or failure that's causing an overamp condition or we just didn't quite know what we were getting ourselves into um, that fuse is there to protect us and protect the meter but mostly it's there to protect us uh, voltage is pressure right so here's our plunger pushing electrons through a circuit, and this is not a pasta maker, this is the stranded wires inside of a regular wire. So pressure, force, um, potential, these are all different words for voltage. And when we measure voltage, our meter is going to be in parallel with the circuit. And this is one of the reasons why it's important that our meters have really high internal resistance. If I had low resistance, the current would try to flow through the meter instead of through the circuit. And on the old analog meters, the ones with the uh, needles, those, if you hooked them up to a working circuit, sometimes they would cause the circuit to stop working because so much of the voltage was traveling through the meter that like a light bulb would go out. Um, and that makes it hard to, you know, come up with good test results because if the circuit changes the way that it works when you hook the meter up, you can't really get a good measurement of how the circuit's actually working. So meter is in parallel on a, on a um, voltage test. Resistance is anything that makes it hard for current to flow. Um, we have pretty close to fixed voltage on our cars, somewhere between 12.6 and I guess some charging systems now can get up to about 15, 15 and a half. Uh, volts trying to charge the battery back up but 
in relative terms, that's a pretty small window. So when we build um, circuits, the resistance is, is really vital to um, limiting the amount of current that can flow through the circuit. If we limit it too much, the circuit can't do the work that we want it to do. If we don't limit it enough, we might actually burn some components up. And there's our resistance measurement being taken. When the meter measures resistance, it actually puts voltage uh, or applies a voltage to the circuit and then it measures how much current can flow through the circuit. So it's really important that the circuit is isolated. Um, whatever section we're trying to test, we want it isolated from not just power sources but other circuitry as well because if we start to um, have multiple pathways to ground, let's say, it can give us false um, resistance readings or at least ones that we it would give us a reading that we couldn't really use for diagnostic processes. So when we do a resistance measurement, we really want to know that we have the circuit completely isolated and we're testing between these two points. How much resistance is there? The resistance of this conductor is in play and so is the resistance of the bulb. If we wanted just the bulb, we'd have to move our meter leads much closer to it or maybe even remove the bulb from its socket and test it, it directly. Our complete circuit is going to have a power source, it's going to have a fuse to protect it, and it's going to have a load, and I would argue that it's nice if we have some sort of a switch or control device so that we can turn the circuit off. The way that this circuit is set up right here, if I just left it hooked up, it would um, have this bulb burn and bright until the battery started to discharge, and eventually it would fully discharge the battery. So having a switch is pretty important as far as um, our power source is concerned for, for sure and maybe I want to go to sleep and I don't want the light bulb to be on. I don't want to have to necessarily pull out tools and disconnect the battery every single time or pull a fuse out and make sure I put it back in later. A, a switch would be very convenient. Oh, there's a switch. And this time we're using ground, so some body metal body component of the vehicle to allow current to travel back to the battery because current that flows out of the battery has to return to the battery again in the same battery. Um, I once tried to do some voltage testing when I was a young technician with a booster pack. I had the, it was, I was in like the back of a vehicle and I was trying to make sure I had a good ground. I was like, well, this booster pack's got negative. I'll just use that as ground. That's not how it works. These circuits have to be a closed loop um, and I would have to have wired in that booster pack to the car so that it was part of the power and ground pathways before it was any good to me whatsoever. And that's a lot harder than just finding a good wire or, or a test lead or a jumper or something like that to get me to a good ground. And that's just a better illustration of how the ground works. The car is made out of metal. Metal is a conductor. Why add extra wires? which would add extra weight and extra cost because wire is not cheap um, to the vehicle when we already have a bunch of good pathways. Uh, we tend to use the, the body for the ground pathway because the voltage has already been dropped so there's less likelihood of um, any kind of electrocution or sparks or heat or anything like that being called uh, caused. And also the old um, MGs that were made over in Europe and England, they um, tried to use a power side ground, so a positive side ground. Well, let me say that again. A, they wanted to use the body of the vehicle to allow the positive, um, the pathway to the positive terminal of the battery, and they ended up having lots of issues with corrosion. Um, it accelerated the rate that their vehicles would rust because rust is very similar to what's happening inside of our battery. It's called electrolysis. And the reason that metal rusts is when you get salty water on a metal component, that acts like an electrolyte, like the acid inside of a battery. And it allows um, electrons to move from one piece of metal to another and as those electrons are taken away from the piece of metal, the original piece of metal, it starts to change its composition and becomes less robust of a metal. It starts to decay, and that's the that's visibly seen as rust or corrosion. 
Um, so the fuse or the circuit breaker will open um, to, to limit the amount of damage that can happen elsewhere in the circuit. We don't, if we burn up an entire wire and have to pull a dashboard out to replace it, that's a bummer. It'd be way nicer if the fuse would just pop and we could just go in and possibly just find the one spot where the wire is is um, touching on some metal through its its um, insulating um, the insulation that's around the wiring itself uh, and saves a lot of time a lot of money and potentially could keep something from catching on fire and there's an image of a short to ground short to grounds really only matter if they happen on the power side of the circuit so what happens here is when I have this pathway to ground I no longer have any resistance to limit my current flow so I would have basically the potential for infinite current flow. My battery is limited, right? We have a, a cold cranking amperage um, that we're expecting the battery can put out, and, but that's still hundreds of amps of capacity that that battery can put out, way more than a little 12 gauge wire can handle, and much more than an 18 gauge wire can handle, which we see a lot of those in cars. So that would pop our fuse, and so then at that point we would have the the circuit would no longer be working, but we have the ability then to go in and try to diagnose the issue instead. If I have a short to ground on the ground side, I really just have more ground, and so that's fine. The voltage has already been dropped, the current flow has been limited by the resistance in the circuit. The only issue with a short to ground on the ground side that may come up is corrosion, right? The insulating uh, wrapper of our wire is is there just as much to keep air and moisture away from the metal as it is to keep the, the current pathway pristine. Shorts can also, um, you can have a short to power between two different circuits, which means when the control device of one circuit is closed to allow current to flow through it, it may also allow current to flow to another, to, through another circuit as well, causing that one to work. Like you try to roll down one window and both windows roll down, that kind of a thing. Common issues that um, are associated with circuit faults or failures all pretty much have to do with resistance and higher resistance than expected. A broken wire, uh, open component, so like the bulbs burnt out, the motor's broken, whatever. Loose connections and corrosion cause high resistance, and a blown fuse causes high resistance in the circuit, but the fuse is blown due to low resistance. So this is you know, one of the few cases where low resistance can cause an issue. As current flows through our circuit and um, goes through its resistances, the potential energy that it has is lost. And so this water wheel is just depicting here's my battery basically and I'm flowing through the circuit through some conductors and then I do some work the light bulb lights up and that potential energy is lost and we make it down to ground eventually and we have no potential then we have to drop all of our voltage by the time we make it to ground um, or the negative side of our battery however you'd like to think about it and this is just an image that I, I've had some students say helps them make some sense over what's going on inside the circuit. Ohm's law, we're going to be using that a whole lot. There's another um, lecture up of me doing lots of Ohm's law and working on some circuits. So I recommend you definitely take some time with that. I know circuit mass not the most fun thing in the world. And at the end of this class, it'd be great if you were, if you were pretty secure in some of your basics of circuit math. But really what I, I care about and the, the takeaways from circuit math that I think are important are just being able to look at a diagram or to start addressing an electrical circuit or an electronic circuit or a diagnosis and have some intuition on what should be going on. What should I be seeing for voltage? Why might I not be seeing that voltage that I was expecting to see? And practicing circuit math is really just practicing um, these concepts. So oh, there's our little circuit doing its thing. And then this looks like an Ohm's Law chart, 
Um, but instead of the E, right, for electromotive force, I have a P, power, watts. Um, this is a measurement of how much work is being done in a circuit. A circuit with more wattage is going to do more work. So like, let's think about going to the hardware store and buying some light bulbs. A 60 watt bulb is going to be a lot brighter than a 40 watt bulb. And that watts is, is just a, a dude who um, did a lot of inventing and tinkering and he came up with this unit of measure named him after himself as you know like all of this stuff is named after people but named it after himself because he wanted some sort of a unit to be able or a measurement of work so that when he went and tried to sell like his his um, refined steam engine he wanted to be able to explain to other individuals what the steam engine is capable of doing so he made he made a couple different things. One was horsepower, which is garbage as far as I'm concerned, but that's a topic for another day. And then watts is, is like the metric system, basically. It's directly convertible to many different things. And then here's a chart that has all the different equations to go between volts and amps and ohms and watts and all that kind of stuff. So definitely worth taking some time and looking at. And that brings us to the end of our show. Um, not the end of all lectures for the entire semester, but um, definitely the end of this one. I miss having your feedback and your comments, and I even miss getting knocked around by a few of you guys every once in a while. So I hope you're doing well, and I'll see you next time.